Now, Monitor brings you Meet the Press, the prize-winning interview program produced by Lawrence E. Spivak. Ready for the spontaneous, unrehearsed conference are four of America's top news reporters. Their questions do not necessarily reflect their point of view, but may be their way of getting a story for you. Now, here's the moderator of Meet the Press, Ned Brook. Welcome once again to Meet the Press. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, established 10 years ago as a shield against aggression, has just concluded its anniversary meeting here in Washington. Our guest is the Secretary General of NATO, Monsieur Paul Henri Spock of Belgium. The 15 Western nations con convened against the background of the crisis in Berlin and the forthcoming negotiations with the Soviet Union. Yesterday, the Council reaffirmed its determination to stand firm in the face of communist threats against Berlin's freedom. Monsieur Spock has long been a champion of European unity. With good reason, he is called Mr. Europe. He has been one of the top figures in the Council of Europe. He presided over the first assembly of the United Nations in 1946. In his early days as a socialist, he was known as the firebrand of Belgium. Monsieur Spock has been an unrelenting enemy of communism. He served three times as the prime minister of Belgium, four times as the foreign minister. And now seated around the press table ready to interview Monsieur Spock are Marquis Childs of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, May Craig of the Portland, Maine Press-Herald, Chalmers Roberts of the Washington Post and Times-Herald, and Lawrence E. Spivak, our regular member of the Meet the Press panel. Seated next to our guest is Colonel Vernon Walters, who will act as interpreter when and if needed. Now, Mr. Secretary, if you're ready, sir, yes. we'll start the questions with Mr. Spivak. Mr. Spock, at your press conference the other day, you said you did not believe there would be a war over Berlin. On what do you base that optimistic belief? Well, because I think that the principal goal of the Russians, of the communists, is to dominate the world. But if they could economize a third world war, I am, I am certain that they will try to do that. It is a very difficult affair for the communists to make war, to wage war. And if uh, they could avoid that, uh, I think that is their resolution. Uh. NATO and the three great Western powers are all agree to take a firm stand on Berlin. That is correct, isn't it? It is quite correct. Well, now, what exactly does a firm stand mean? Is it notice to the Soviets that we will go to war before we are pushed out of Berlin? I think it is a very important question to know what is to be firm in Berlin. To be firm in Berlin is to keep free communication, uh, civilian and military free communication for the city of Berlin. And we must have guarantee for this free communication. That is to be firm. And if the Russians or in Germany try to, to uh, refuse or to, to, to avoid this free communication for the West, then the situation could be very serious. Well, that's what we have now. We have free communication now. Well, yes. what are we going to negotiate then? Well, what could be negotiated is the details of the free communication. Um, but uh, on, on the principal thing, free negotiation, we must be firm. It is impossible for the Russian to hope that we are ready to withdraw the foreign troops from Berlin and to abandon the Berliners. I, I must realize, and I realize very well, that the, the possibility of negotiations is very narrow. We really have nothing to negotiate on Berlin, have we? We're going to the conference to say we will not be pushed out of Berlin. Isn't that so? Is it? Yes, it is so. I think so. Mr. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Secretary, the minister spent a great deal of time this, these past few days talking about Berlin and Europe in general. What 
what was accomplished by this meeting of, of NATO here this last week? Well, you realize that uh, in December, we said that the question of Berlin is a part of the question of Germany. We tried to, to discuss the whole question, Germany and Berlin. And then to find a solution for the Germans' problem, it is also very difficult. And at this time, we are studying all the possibility, all the hypothesis, and we have to make a choice to present to the Russians a complete uh, solution for Germany and for Berlin. Was a choice made? No, I, I can't say so. I think we some progress uh, were made but the definite choice is not made at this time and yet you say in the communique that there was unity on all the at least broad principles but you had that unity did you not before this meeting started on broad principles oh yes that is uh, nothing new on that because uh, since december uh, we have some uh, principles on the question of Germany and also on the question of Berlin, and we stand firm of these principles. Just the language we come to expect in communique. Oh, I see. <laughs> Mrs. Craig. Mr. Secretary, we have told the Russians that we will fly our planes at any altitude we want to in the Berlin Air Corridor. Now, if we defy them in the air, why don't we defy them on the ground? I do not understand very well the question. I think when I speak about free communication, it is free communication by the air and on the road. I think we must uh, stand on this uh, point. Then you think we were wrong in the first time to go into the airlift instead no. of insisting on the ground? No, no, I can't say that it is a question, uh, a military question, and I am not an expert for that. Uh, I suppose that if uh, uh, in 49 uh, it was uh, airlift, I suppose that the military experts uh, think that was the best solution. Um. It is a technical solution. Uh, the words being used confuse me a little. We say we would accept Germans checkpointing on the roads uh, as uh, agents, but not as substitutes. Would you explain what you mean by an agent? But uh, I am not sure that at this time we agree on that. I think that was one idea among many other ideas, and I am not sure that at this time the West is uh, prepared to accept uh, uh, this uh, Eastern German agency. I think you, it is too early to say that. Mr. Childs. I would like uh, Mr. Secretary to come back to this question of standing firm. One or two of the foreign ministers who have been here have suggested that more drastic steps should be taken to prove to the Russians that we are going to stand firm, such as mobilization before May 27, or such as telling American tourists to keep away from Europe, to prove this. Do you think these steps are necessary? No, really I don't think so. First, I, I don't think that the, 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 the day of the 27 is uh, still very important. I suppose that nothing will happen the 27, because certainly we shall, um, in, in complete uh, negotiation at this time, the foreign minister and probably after that the, the summit conference. I think that uh, the 27 is no more uh, an important day. And I think we must go with uh, will to negotiate and I don't think that this sort of uh, military preparation at this time uh, is a good uh, idea. Well. Excuse me, do you think that the Russians will believe that we intend to stand firm, Mr. Secretary? I, I think it is very important. I, I said that yesterday in my uh, uh, press conference. The Russians must know that we are united and that we are decided to be firm in Berlin. Certainly on the details, there are some nuances. 
between the country and the and the ministers. But on the principles, we are united. There are no differences. And uh, every country, the big country in the NATO and the small country, realized uh, perfectly the importance of the questions and the importance to be firm uh, in Berlin. If uh, Berlin is a failure, if it's a, a diplomatic disaster, it could be very, very important and grave for Europe and for NATO and for all the West. Mr. Secretary, President Eisenhower told us recently that it would be foolish to think of fighting a ground war over Berlin. Now, since NATO is primarily, or was primarily, set up as a ground force, just what would its value be if the hostility should break out in Berlin? Personally, but I am not a military expert, I think it is very difficult to, to conceive a difference between a conventional war and an atomic war. Personally, I think if one day uh, the Russians are ready to wage war, they are ready to, to make a big war, an atomic war, and it is very difficult for me to conceive a, a war on the ground and limit to uh, conventional uh, weapons. Mr. Spivak. Uh, Mr. Spark, may I get this straight? You say that if there is no unity on anything else among the 15 nations, there is unity on one thing, and that is that the West will not be pushed out of Berlin. Is that correct? More than that, I think on, on a certain very important idea, we are completely united. Um, we think that uh, it is impossible for us to admit a neutralization of Germany. We think that it is impossible for us to follow a policy which would uh, lead the Americans, the British, and the Canadian troops to go out of Europe. We think that we must affirm the right of the German people to be united. And we think that we must be firm in Berlin, it is to say, to keep free communication between Berlin and the free world. I think these four important principles. And by firmness you mean even up to the risk of war. I, I don't like war, but I think no. that uh, we must be firm with all the consequences. All right. Now, you know the 15 NATO nations, the 15 members of NATO. Do you believe that all 15 members of NATO will go to war against the Soviet Union and risk nuclear destruction rather than allow the West to be pushed out of Berlin? This is a fundamental question, isn't it? I think that if the Russians really tried to push the big uh, countries, uh, United States, Great Britain, and France out of Berlin, I think that the risk of war is uh, serious. And do you think that the 15 NATO nations, the other 12, will stand back? Well, that is the treaty, you know. The troops, uh, the French and the British and the United States troops uh, in Berlin are, are covered by the treaty, by the North Atlantic Treaty. If you have an incident in Berlin uh, between the Russians and the American troops, it is uh, uh, okay, what, what we call a casus federis. Well, there is no absolute agreement to go to war. Under Article 5 of the NATO agreement, I understand, they only have to take such action as they deem necessary. Well, it is uh, true that uh, war is not automatic, but uh, the true spirit of the treaty is if uh, the American troops or the English troops or the French troops uh, are victims of an aggression in Berlin, the other countries must accept the consequences of that. And from what you know of the other NATO countries, you don't believe that there's any chance that they won't come to the aid? No, I think really that the, that the countries in Europe are completely conscious of the gravity of the situation. Because if we are weak on Berlin, it is sure that we shall be blackmailed by the Russians on other points in Europe, tomorrow in Denmark, then in Norway, in Luxembourg, and the 
the European countries realize that perfectly well. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Spock, you say Berlin, but in fact you are talking about only West Berlin, are you not? And, yes. And if so, why aren't we talking about the rest of Berlin? If, if we're there in the West by right of conquest, the whole city fell by right of conquest to the victors who then divided it. Why don't we raise the issue of East Berlin? And we talk about uh, West Berlin because that is a problem put on the table by the Russians. But it is a possibility in the negotiation to speak about uh, all Berlin. It is one of the possibilities, certainly, isn't this to make really, other proposition. Isn't this really the, the weakness of NATO that we're proposing to negotiate, as you say, on the proposal put on the table by the Russians? It is perhaps perhaps a weakness, but it is the fact. It is the fact that this, it is the Russians who put the question of Germany and on Berlin on the table in, in November. We must realize that, and then it is possible uh, during the negotiation that we make a proposal about uh, uh, Berlin. Uh, uh, East Berlin too. I do not know. It is Was that discussed last week? Please. Was East Berlin discussed here last week? No, I couldn't say so. Mrs. Craig. Yeah. Mr. Spock, NATO must depend primarily on the United States for its military strength. That, that is quite true. Yes. There's a big fuss in this country as to whether we have enough strength and whether we have the right kind. Now, you have to look after NATO. Do you think that we have enough of the right strength to give you if you need it? What I could say, that is, that uh, the United States make in, in Europe a very great effort. That is the truth. Without the help of the United States, there are no more European army. And we must be very grateful to the United States, the government and the people that was not my point. There's a fuss in this country as to whether we're doing enough in military strength against the Soviet power. Do you think we are? And that's essential to you for NATO. Well, personally, I think that in NATO, I, I know only the, the NATO plans, in NATO, the United States may spar very well. In NATO. But I do not know the plan in the other part of the world. But I could only speak for NATO. And in NATO, certainly, the United States make its part completely. And perhaps the best of all the NATO countries. Do you think the United States should concentrate on uh, missiles, bombers, and uh, navy, or, and leave the uh, conventional forces to Europe? You know, I am a politician and perhaps a diplomat, but I am not an expert in military questions. It is a very important military question, and I am, I am not the experienced to, to answer to that. I must recognize that. But, sir, the defense of NATO is in your well, hands. Well, Ed, then my answer is clear. At this time, the defense of NATO has two parts, a shield and the deterrent. And at this time, the, uh, the military doctrine of NATO is to have the two things. Mr. Childs. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you wrote in Foreign Affairs, the magazine, about the stubborn forces of nationalism and individualism within the alliance. And you pointed out that France must spend billions to do all over again in the atomic field what has already been done by the United States and Britain. In your opinion, should the American laws be changed so that we can give France atomic knowledge and NATO atomic weapons? Yes, but here I must be careful because in this article of uh, foreign affairs, I take the precaution to, to say that I, I speak uh, uh, under my own responsibilities and not as Secretary General of NATO. If you ask my own own idea on that, I could answer, but it is not a, a NATO answer. 
Well, I would like to have your <laughs> idea. Well, my idea is what you said. I, I think that we must try to organize better uh, the war effort, the production of arms, of uh, weapons, and also the, some uh, kind of economic cooperation. That is my own idea, but uh, I must uh, recognize and I realize quite well that on this question I am perhaps a little uh, uh, before the governments and perhaps also the people. In uh, your official report that you made to the council here, you were quoted as saying that the economic side of NATO was its weakest side mm -hmm and might compromise its military and political success. Mm -hmm. Now, what was done in this meeting to correct that weakness? Well, everybody is very kind and, and say that, I, that what I, I said and wrote in my, my report is true. But it is something to approve uh, in words and other things to act. I am sure that in the next years, the economic problems and uh, even the economic problems in the underdeveloped country will be the most important problem for the West in the struggles against communism. Well, I, I notice, excuse me, that General de Gaulle proposed a common pool of resources. Do you think NATO should do something like this for the underdeveloped Well, countries? I don't think that NATO is uh, the right organization to do that, but my ambition is that NATO uh, could be, on this matter, a sort of uh, a political council. Advisory? Advisory, yes, that's it. Mr. Spivak. Uh, Mr. Secretary, at the present time, NATO only applies to Europe, yet the increasing danger is in the Middle East and Africa and Asia. Do you think NATO ought to become a real alliance dedicated to defense against Soviet Russia wherever she threatens? Well, that is also my, my own responsibility and my own answer. I think so, but it is very difficult to change the Washington Treaty. You know, to change the treaty, we must have unanimity. Unanimity of the government, and then every change in the treaty must pass before 15 parliaments. It is not an easy thing to do. But uh, still, no. We discuss in NATO questions outside the era of the uh, NATO treaty, NATO, yes, uh, the geographical uh, limits of the treaty. It is a beginning, but another thing is to take uh, military commitments in other parts of the world. And certainly, uh, certain countries will be uh, very careful on that. Mr. Secretary, this is something that I know as Secretary General must concern you greatly. Do you think that the French decision to withdraw our Mediterranean fleet from NATO's uh, command is a challenge to NATO's basic principle of integration? Well, for me, the question is this. This question is now under discussion in the Permanent Council. We have to know what is the uh, idea of the question of the military authorities, and then we shall have a discussion in the Council. But uh, we are waiting for the... Uh, opinion of the military authorities on this uh, question. But can there be any unity at all in NATO if any country unilaterally can decide to no. withdraw? They could do that uh, unilaterally uh, you, uh, uh, alone. They could do that alone. Uh, uh, the procedure is to discuss the question in NATO, and at this time, this question is before the Permanent Council. We have not taken a decision about that. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Secretary, you said it's very difficult to change the NATO treaty. But was there not discussion a couple of years ago of a link between NATO and the two other main treaties, the Baghdad Pact in the Middle East yes, and Seattle yes. in Asia? 
But it is quite possible to do that without change the treaty. But we have some relations now with the other organizations. Well, I wanted to ask you about that. Is there any real relationship? Did you do uh, anything about it last week? It depends what you call a real relations. We have some relations at this time. We try to exchange some information and to... It is a beginning. Did you make any progress yes, on that we last some, week? Yes, we make some progress. What, what, did, what are you doing? Well, it is a question, you know, it is a process issue. You could make a very big change very quickly. We have some relations and then we try to have more and more. And we must be careful, but it is something, in my idea, very interesting. Mrs. Craig. Do you think that NATO countries should have first priority in military and economic aid from the United States? Well, if I am a selfish, I will say yes. I think it's very important for the United States to help the NATO countries, but I realize perfectly that the United States uh, has an um, interest in other parts in the world. But uh, certainly, I, I, I hope that the help of the United States will, will continue and very important. Mr. Childs. Several sources have suggested, Mr. Secretary, that you should go to Moscow to negotiate with Mr. Khrushchev directly for NATO. Do you think this is a good idea? <laughs> no, no. You wouldn't want to do this? It is impossible because uh, the big country has to defend themselves there. Interest, it is quite impossible. Well, I think at that point I will going to have to interrupt. Thank you very much, Monsieur Spock, for being with us. And our thanks to our interpreter, Colonel Walters. Our thanks to NATO Secretary General Paul Henri Spock and the members of the panel for a stimulating and enlightening half hour. Meet the Press is produced by Lawrence East Vivac. And now a personal word, if I may. April is USO month, and here is a story about Americans in Korea, where large numbers of American troops are still on duty, playing the waiting game with communist forces to the north. Every day at the USO club in Seoul, a cake donated by someone from the American colony helps celebrate the birthday of a serviceman stationed there. It's a real hometown treat because in all of Korea, there isn't a single civilian baker on limits to GIs. In fact, there are few non-military facilities besides the USO which are. On a typical Saturday night, a crowd of American servicemen will be found in the club reading, lounging, eating, or taking that final hot shower before returning to duty at the front zone. The Seoul Club is only one of 267 USO centers serving Americans in uniform all around the world. During USO month in April, remember that the USO is a voluntary civilian organization. It needs and welcomes your active support. This is George Putnam. Thank you, and good night. <laughs> This is Monitor, the NBC weekend radio service.